Great Smoky Mountains, July 2014. My name is Joshua, and I want to share with you a story about a strange encounter I had in the beautiful Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You see, I've always been fascinated by the mysteries of the wilderness there, so I often find myself exploring its wonders. This time, my adventure took me deep into the heart of the park. It was a sunny morning in July of 2014, and I had set out on a hike along the Trillium Gap Trail. The trail wound through dense forests, beside sparkling streams, and past towering mountains. I was hoping to catch a glimpse of some elusive wildlife that called the park home. Little did I know that I was about to encounter something beyond my wildest dreams. As I made my way through the trail, I felt a mix of excitement and anticipation. Suddenly, a rustling noise caught my attention. I stopped in my tracks, trying to locate the source of the sound. I looked around. Nothing was there. But then, I saw it. A creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It stood tall, with dark fur covering its entire body. Its large, muscular frame reminded me of the legendary Sasquatch. At first, I felt a surge of fear shoot through my veins. My heart raced and my breath quickened. I had heard stories about mysterious creatures lurking in these woods, but I never expected to come face to face with one. However, as I observed the creature more closely, I realized that it didn't seem aggressive or threatening. Instead, there was this sense of calmness and curiosity in its eyes. The encounter took place near a clearing not far from the trail. I cautiously took a step closer, hoping to get a better look. The creature, seemingly unbothered by my presence, remained still, watching me with an air of intrigue. I could hardly believe my luck, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study a creature from the realms of myth. Overwhelmed with a surge of curiosity, I decided to take a chance and try to communicate with the creature. I spoke softly, introducing myself and expressing my fascination. To my astonishment, the creature seemed to understand me, and it responded with a series of deep, rumbling sounds that almost resembled words, but I couldn't decipher their meaning. As the minutes turned into what felt like an eternity, the encounter between myself and the creature continued. We communicated in our own unique way, sharing a connection, and somehow talking to each other. It felt as if we were two beings from different worlds, but meeting briefly in this hidden corner of the park. During our interaction, a second person came upon the trail. He was an elderly hiker who had been exploring the park, too. I watched as he approached, and he finally saw what was going on. He then stood there in awe, witnessing the extraordinary encounter unfold before his eyes. He remained silent, understanding the significance. But he had no direct relationship with the creature or me. Eventually, we both watched as the creature retreated into the depths of the forest, disappearing as mysteriously as it had appeared. The hiker and I were left standing there awestruck and filled with wonder. The encounter had definitely left an indelible mark on us and we knew that life would never be the same. The man continued on his journey. I watched him as he walked off. He told me what an extraordinary experience it was for him and that he was going to ponder how to move forward with the information. As for me, I couldn't help but feel a mix of joy and sadness joy for having witnessed something truly extraordinary, and sadness knowing that many people won't believe my story. As I made my way back along the trail, my mind filled with thoughts of the creature. It hadn't acted wild towards me, like bears that I've encountered in the past. It displayed a gentle and curious nature, leaving me with a sense of awe rather than fear made me question the assumptions I had about untamed wilderness and the unknown creatures that might inhabit it. Ultimately, this encounter ignited a newfound passion for me, for the mysteries of nature. I started then to dedicate myself to learning more about unknown creatures, creatures that might inhabit our world. 
I also began volunteering at wildlife conservation organizations, supporting efforts to protect and preserve the habitats of any magnificent creature that might live in our midst. Thanks for letting me share my brief but incredible encounter. The story I'm about to share happened about 10 years ago when I was working for the government. I've heard some of your other government stories from people, and that's what prompted me to want to write into you, too. I was younger and idealistic back then, and I thought that my job would be exciting and glamorous. But it turns out that most of government work is pretty boring. Now, don't get me wrong, there are moments of excitement, but those are usually followed by a lot of paperwork. My work did entail a lot of travel. I worked for the National Park Service, and I was often sent to different national parks around the country to check in and to make sure everything was up to snuff, inspecting protocols and the like. And it was during one of those trips to a park that you will 100% recognize that I witnessed something that changed my view of the government forever. I was in Yellowstone National Park doing a routine inspection of the facilities there when I saw something strange. Now, I can't say for sure what it was that I saw, but it definitely wasn't anything that I had ever seen before. It was some sort of living creature, but it was unlike anything in a zoo or anywhere else. So on my first night at the park, I was driving around in the evening really getting deep into the park when I stopped my car to take a look around during a particularly beautiful sunset. And that's when I saw it. The creature was walking on two legs, but did not have fur, which was instantly a strange combination to me. I tried to take a picture of it so I could ask somebody more knowledgeable what it was, but it ran off before I could get a clear shot. All I can say is that it looked like some kind of a reptile or alien creature. It was definitely not anything that's supposed to exist in our world. I would describe it like this. It was about seven feet tall, and it had light gray, scaly skin, but it also had sort of a greenish tinge to it. It didn't escape me that those are especially good camouflage colors for the park. And it had this long tail, which was very evident when it turned around and took off and I could see that its eyes glowed yellow when I first caught sight of it. That was the creepiest part. The yellow eyes with those sideways slits. I mean, you know you're not dealing with something nice when you see eyes like that. When it ran off, it moved very fast, too, and it seemed to be able to disappear into the shadows of the setting sun. The movement of its legs was strange, and it almost seemed to be hopping, but at the same time, it was running. Again, not like anything I've ever seen before. I reported what I had seen to my superiors when I touched base with them the next morning, but they brushed it off quickly, and they told me not to worry about it, basically redirecting me back to talking about the job that I was there to do. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was not right. I did some more research using my computer accesses to get into certain databases that we have, and I discovered that there have been numerous reports of strange creatures in national parks all over the country, not just Yellowstone. And I hate to say it, but it also looks like the government has been aware of these reports for years, but they have never acknowledged them publicly. I started to piece together the puzzle, and it wasn't long before I came to the conclusion that the government is covering up a program on cryptid creatures in national parks. They were trying to keep the program and the creatures secret from the public, but I had stumbled upon their secret. So I decided to approach the Yellowstone workers that I had become friendly with, and I asked them if they had seen anything strange, ever. At first, they were hesitant to talk to me, but after I assured them that I wouldn't tell anybody, they started to open up. I learned that there have been sightings of all sorts of creatures in the park, including some that match the description of what I saw. Apparently, this has been going on for years, but they've been successful in keeping it a secret. So all of this information only served to fuel my interest in the subject. I decided that before I left Yellowstone, I would take a hike off the beaten path that goes in the direction that I had seen this thing, just to see if I could find any further evidence. 
I packed a bag with some supplies, headed out, and it didn't take me long before I found something odd. There was a trail of large footprints that led deep into the woods. Remember, this is a very deep section of the park. I followed those footprints for miles until I came to a clearing. And there, in the middle of the clearing, was a group of these creatures. Well, three to be exact. They were eating and playing and completely unaware of my presence. I watched them for a bit. It was interesting. There was almost a humanoid quality to them. But then I started to feel nervous, and I had to get back. So I quietly got up, retreated my steps, and got back to my car. I knew that I had seen something incredible, something that the government didn't want anybody to know about. I also knew that I couldn't tell anybody what I had seen. I just knew that that would be bad. Plus, I wanted to keep my job, and that meant just keeping my head low. But the story is something that I have to share. I can't keep it inside any longer. I mean, the government can try to keep a secret, but the truth will always find a way to be revealed. I worked as a ranger for the National Park Service for many years, and in that time I saw some pretty strange things. But Nothing could prepare me for what I witnessed one day in Grand Teton National Park. I was out on patrol making my rounds through the park. It was late in September and the leaves were just starting to change color. The air was crisp and the sky was clear, and I remember thinking it was going to be a beautiful day. I was driving along the road, keeping an eye out for wildlife and any visitors in need of assistance. As I rounded a bend, I saw something moving in the bushes off to the side of the road. Or, more accurately, I should say that I saw the bushes shaking in an unusual way and that none of the other bushes were moving. So I rolled my vehicle to a stop closer to the bush, but remained inside. I wanted to be safe and not sorry in case I was about to encounter a sick or wounded animal. Animals that are scared or in shock can be very dangerous. What I observed next completely shocked me. It wasn't long before out from the undergrowth came this furry, large creature. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but there, in front of me, was a creature I had never seen before. It was large, with a long snout, almost a cross between a bear and a wolf and a rat, if you can picture those things together, but more the size of a bear and the creature was just staring at me. I think the sound of my vehicle had brought it out, and for a moment we locked eyes, and it cocked its head a bit and squinted. It just looked at me very intently. It was like it was almost trying to communicate with me. At least that's how I felt. Luckily it didn't look wounded, so I felt better about that, and then as suddenly as it had appeared from the brush, it ran off, and it was gone. I sat in my car for a few minutes trying to process it. I knew there were no animals like that in Grand Teton National Park, but what could it have been? Was I seeing things? Did I even see what I just saw? I then decided to get out of my vehicle and check the bushes that it had been in. Maybe there was something there that could help me understand what I had just seen. I walked over to the exact spot and looked down. There, in the grass were large footprints, wide footprints, with five toes and a ten-inch width. Well, that didn't help me because I definitely had never seen that footprint before. This was definitely not something I had seen ever, and it honestly left me with more questions than answers. I radioed into headquarters and told them about the incident and what I was finding. My boss, who I really like a lot, told me to come back to the station and fill out a report. But to be honest, I don't think he really processed what I said because he didn't react with any surprise. He almost sounded distracted and just answering me without thinking. When I got back to the station, I sat down, wrote out the report of what I had seen, but even as I did, I still couldn't quite believe it myself. I did submit the report, and I went home that evening. But the image of that creature stayed with me. I just couldn't get it out of my mind. I did some research and I found out that there have been other sightings of similar creatures in national parks across the country. Commonly, people refer to them as cryptids. 
There's no scientific evidence of their existence, but there are enough reports from reliable witnesses to make me believe that they are real. I never did see that creature again, but I often think about it, and I wonder where it came from, and what its life is like, honestly. Maybe one day we will have the answers to those questions, but until then, I'm just happy to know that there are still some mysteries in I want to tell you guys about something weird that happened to me and my boyfriend last weekend. We live in Teleco Plains, Tennessee, and we went out to the Dollar General on Sunday afternoon to buy some stuff for the week. On our way home, we were driving along one of the back roads and the car started to sputter. It's a real clunker, but we just can't afford to buy a new one. So we were just praying it would go a little further because that stretch of road is pretty remote. And I really didn't want to have to walk two miles in sandals with wedge heels. But no, luck wasn't with us and the damn thing coasted to a stop. Thankfully, my boyfriend Frank managed to steer it off the road as it died. So at least it wasn't sitting in the middle of the road. It was Sunday evening by then, so there wasn't much chance of us getting a tow unless we went with one of those 24-hour services. And they can charge an arm and a leg. As far as small local garages go, you get Teleco Auto and Sheps, and they're both closed on Sundays. It's a pretty small town. I know some of you are going to say we should have AAA. Yeah, that'd be nice, but these days we can barely afford our rent. Anyhow, it sucked, but sometimes you just have to deal with it. I knew Frank didn't want to call anybody we knew for help, since it seemed that lately we were always asking for favors. The pandemic really screwed us up, and now all we can find is part-time work. So, we started walking. Frank seemed pretty hopeful that a car would come along sooner or later, and we wouldn't have to walk the whole way. He might have been just trying to make me feel better. So, we were walking along on the side of the road, and then there's this area of deep woods before it opens up to a field. As we were hoofing it along next to those woods, I started getting this creepy feeling that something was in there watching us. I kept looking off to the side, and Frank noticed and asked me what was wrong. I felt kind of silly, but I told him, and he laughed and said, Not to worry. It's not like there's anything big enough to hurt us where we live. He's right, as far as animals go. Foxes, raccoons, possum, and deer don't exactly pose a threat. But I was kind of spooking myself, thinking it was possibly a person. Which is totally not logical, because we're out in the middle of nowhere, right? Well, I was right, and there was something there. We both heard a noise behind us, and we turned around to look, and there, standing in the middle of the road, was something like a person. I was like, is that a person? Because it was tall enough to be one. But we couldn't see it that well but it didn't look right to be a human form. It was up on two legs, but the upper body seemed triangular. Frank said, I don't know what the hell that is. Let's go. And he started hurrying, which made me nervous because he's never scared. So here I am trying to walk faster and my feet are killing me. I keep looking behind us and even though I never saw it move, somehow this thing seemed closer every time I looked. And that really started to freak me out. Frank must have noticed it, too, because all of a sudden he stopped and turned around yelling, Hey! Really loud, like he was trying to scare it off. I turned around, too, to see, and this thing was maybe 25 feet behind us. I don't know, I'm bad with guessing distances, but right after Frank yelled, it suddenly moved, and its upper body expanded. And I swear to God, this thing had actual wings. These massive wings unfolded all of a sudden to what seemed to be 10 feet wide. And then it gave a little hop and pushed its wings down and just like that, launched itself. There's no other way to describe it. It just took off like a bird, even though it was the size of a man. It didn't come toward us. It just flew up and up until it disappeared off to the side above the woods. And Frank said, holy crap, I was speechless. I mean, I've never been so scared in my life. The only thing I could think was that maybe it was a fallen angel. But that's just my Catholic upbringing, I guess. And anyway, this thing was dark, maybe even black, which wouldn't match an angel. I don't really believe in fallen angels anyway, but then again, this thing was man-shaped and man-sized. 
and it was able to fly. I pulled out my phone right then, ready to call my sister to beg her to come and get us. We didn't really get along, and I didn't want to ask her for help, but I was terrified. Frank grabbed my arm and said, we have to keep walking. So here I am, trying to dial the number, keep up the pace, and I couldn't get the call to go through. It rang a few times, but the signal must have been weak because it just kept dropping the call. I gave up and just concentrated on walking as fast as I could. Frank looked behind us real quick, and I asked him if the thing had come back. I was too scared to look myself. He said no, but keep the pace. And then we saw headlights, and even though they were going in the wrong direction that we wanted to go, coming toward us and not heading toward town, Frank said, let's cross, let's flag him down. And I guess he was as spooked as I was. I knew we would just go anywhere at that point to get away. So we crossed the road. It was this big truck. Frank waved his arms and thank God the guy stopped. We got in and Frank said, we just need to go somewhere, anywhere. Doesn't matter where. He just told the guy we broke down and didn't mention that thing with wings because he probably thought the trucker would boot us out thinking we were lunatics. So the guy was real cool, and he said sure, he'd drop us at the next town. I figured if there was any place open, we could just hang out and decide what to do from there. So then we had only been traveling for about five minutes when all of a sudden the truck's headlights showed the thing ahead of us, standing in the middle of the road. The trucker swore and hit the horn, but it stayed right in the middle of the road till we got really close. The trucker hit his brakes, blew the horn again, and the headlight beams shone right on the creature. It was completely black, except its face, which was gray. It was happening so fast I can't say for sure, but I didn't see a face on it, just red eyes in the headlights, right before it took off. I know it was the same thing that had been behind us because it unfolded those big black wings and shot straight up, flying right up over the damn windshield. The trucker swerved, said, what was that? I held on to Frank with a death grip, afraid we were going to jackknife and crash. The guy got it under control, though, but he must have been pretty shaken up because he pulled off to the side of the road and sat gripping the steering wheel and breathing fast. And that's when my boyfriend told him that that thing had been following us. The guy had no choice but to believe us then because now he had seen it with his own eyes. He pulled back on the road, and we talked about it all the way to the next town. Chad, the trucker, said he'd never seen anything like it before, but that a trucker buddy of his had a similar experience, and based on that, he thought it was a mothman. Frank and I decided together to write you this letter, Lilith, since you know about stuff like this. No one in our town would ever believe us. Do you know anybody who's ever been hurt by a mothman? just wondering why it was following us and what would have happened if we hadn't gotten away. Thank you. From Cassie and Frank. Hey Lilith, big fan of the channel. I'm always fascinated by everybody's encounters and never in a million years did I think I would have an encounter to share myself. I was hesitant to reach out, but I think it might be therapeutic in some way and help me deal with the trauma of what happened that night. You see, I was recently going through a breakup and spent a good amount of time pouting and depressed. My best friend Alex wanted to cheer me up and suggested we spend a weekend at his uncle's remote cabin in the forest near Mount Shasta. I'm not the outdoorsy type, but I had to admit that getting out of the city sounded like a great idea. We left the Bay Area on a Friday morning and began the long drive. On the way, Alex told me that Mount Shasta was known for its strange occurrences. Some of it centered around Native American folklore, but there were also reports of mysterious disappearances, strange lights in the sky, and even Bigfoot. There were also legends of an ancient city hidden deep underneath Mount Shasta itself. I wasn't sure if he was joking, and I wondered why he didn't tell me this before I agreed to the trip. He claimed his uncle never reported anything strange, and the few times he'd been there as a kid, he hadn't seen anything either. I laughed it off because I certainly didn't believe it. We got to the cabin in the afternoon and decided to go on a hike. Alex knew a great spot where we could see a spectacular sunset. 
Before heading out, we packed a cooler. The weather was gorgeous, and the fresh air really helped to clear my mind. About 20 minutes into the hike, though, I sensed something was wrong. But Alex didn't seem to notice anything. He was prattling on about work problems when I realized how quiet the forest had become. No insects, nothing. Just stillness. Suddenly, we were assaulted by this horrible smell. It was like a strong, musky body odor, but mixed with urine and rotting garbage. We weren't sure where it was coming from, and we continued on, hoping we would just pass it by. Soon after, we found a half-eaten deer carcass. It was fresh enough so that the blood was still wet. Alex joked that we had stumbled into Bigfoot's lair, but I did not find that particularly funny. The day that I had been enjoying quickly went away. I was worried about bears and mountain lions and suggested that we just go back. And that's when we heard it. A loud, ungodly screech, unlike anything I've ever heard before. Just thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. It wasn't human, that's for sure. And it echoed all around us. That was our cue to leave. We blazed down the trail, and when we finally got to the cabin, we were out of breath. We looked at each other and laughed, but we didn't talk about it. Instead, we had a beer to calm our nerves and lit up the grill. We soon forgot about what happened, and Alex had me cracking up as we reminisced about our high school days. I lost track of time as we sat on the deck under the stars. It was pretty late when we heard it again, that creepy, screeching sound. This time it was followed by loud, whooping noises, and it sounded like it was pretty close. We froze, and the hair on the back of my head stood up. There was rustling in the trees around us, and we dropped everything and ran into the cabin. Alex locked the door and grabbed two of his uncle's hunting rifles. I had never used a gun before, and I didn't even know how to load the thing. He tried to show me, but the bullets just fell all over the floor. I glanced out the window, and I thought I saw a lumbering silhouette duck into the trees, but I couldn't be sure. It would have been easy for my mind to play tricks on me at this point, but there was no mistaking the hideous sounds that the thing was making. Something heavy then hit the side of the cabin and shook the walls. Alex and I were scared out of our minds, and we huddled together behind a couch in the middle of the living room. And then there was this wet splat against the window as the whooping sounds became even more frenzied. We were too scared to look up, and we stayed hidden as something kept banging the cabin again and again. I swear, I thought that thing was going to break through the walls and rip us apart. It seemed like it went on forever, but I had no sense of time. At some point, all the commotion stopped, and I only remember waking up as the sun was rising, and everything was quiet. Alex was knocked out next to me, so I woke him up. We went outside to investigate, and we finally saw what had been banging the cabin the previous night. Something was throwing the torn pieces of a deer carcass. Its guts had been thrown against the window, and the cabin was smeared with blood. This horrifying image has been seared in my brain ever since. Alex and I got out of there as fast as we could. As I jumped in the car, I also noticed huge footprints in the dirt all around the perimeter. I didn't say anything. In fact, Alex and I didn't talk for the entire four and a half hours it took us to get back to the Bay Area. I haven't seen him since, and he won't return my calls or texts. If there's one thing I can say, at least the experience made me forget about the breakup. It now just seems so insignificant in comparison. Actually, everything does. Well, thanks for letting me share my story. Getting it off my chest really helped. Hey Lilith, I'm so glad I finally have the chance to tell this to somebody. I've been sitting with this story for a while now and honestly, still just trying to process it. So this thing happened to me at the beginning of that baby formula shortage that we had earlier this year. I don't know if you heard about it, but it was nearly impossible to find formula anywhere for a while. And my baby was just four months old at the time, so I was pretty desperate to get out there and to find some. Everybody who needed it was. Every store I went to was completely out and just empty shelf after empty shelf. I went online to see if maybe I could find a recipe for formula, 
you know, there are recipes, but then you read that making your own can be really bad for the baby. And some even say dangerous because the ratio of water to nutrients, everything is precise in formula. Now, I know, I get it, I knew this, but I was desperate. So, in the end, I decided not to try to make my own. But after I exhausted every avenue to find formula, the pediatrician, birthing centers, hospitals, calling every parent I could think of, nobody had anything extra to spare, and I couldn't afford to buy the breast milk that was being offered. So then, I'm looking online, and I see this ad pop up on Facebook Marketplace a picture of a case of formula sitting on top of a tall shelving unit. I messaged the guy, and he said he would hold it for me, says his adult daughter had a bunch of extra from her baby who's now a toddler, and she had put it in a storage unit last year and forgot about it. He asked if I was tall because it's stored up high and he lost his legs and is in a wheelchair. So I say, sure, I can do that myself, no problem, and I put a step stool in the car just in case. So I leave my baby with my mom and the last few portions of formula that I have left, planning to be back within an hour or so. And I was feeling a tiny bit of relief, knowing that I'd soon have formula in my hands, and I was just eager to get back with it. So it was about a 30-minute drive from my place up near the airport. It started to look very industrial as I got closer to this storage facility. Once I pulled up to it, I entered the gate code that the guy gave me and went in, and the guy was waiting for me in his pickup. He waved to me, and I drove up alongside him, and he says, can you go in on your own, and handed me a small key that will unlock the padlock. He added that there's usually a loose guard dog on the premises, and that he was a little scared of dogs being in his chair and all, and so he said, just watch out. Well, I have two German Shepherds myself, and dogs usually like me, so I wasn't too worried. I parked, got out, and remembered to grab my step stool, and then before I headed in, I hear the dog he's talking about panting. I remember I've got those dog treats in my glove box, so I quickly grab a few and shove them in my hoodie pocket. And then I walk over and open the padlock and lift the door to the unit. Enough light spills in so I can see that the back wall is a storage shelf, and there's the formula from the photo. I push myself between the rows of random boxes to get to the back, and I reach up high, but I can barely brush it with my fingertips. So I set the step stool down, and next I hear that dog again. I looked around but didn't see it. I whistled a couple of times, and then I noticed that the guy and his truck weren't out there. It suddenly all seemed very strange, and I got this eerie feeling about being there by myself. I mean, he left, but I hadn't even paid him. But there I am for his formula, and I'm in his storage unit, and I have the key. Anyway, I quickly grab the formula and head back out. And as I'm doing this, I notice the reflection of eyes coming out from this tall ficus tree that's outside the unit. I take a long second to study it. It could be a person messing with me, but the silhouette sort of reminds me of a T-Rex. I even think maybe it's a statue of a T-Rex that somebody was storing and just abandoned it over by the tree. In any case, I'm not sticking around to find out. I need to get home. Anyway, the hairs on my arms were up, so I slam the unit door and shut it behind me, and I hear the key fall to the ground, but I just run to my truck holding on to the formula. I scramble into my truck and I unlock it. Then I turn around and I see that the storage unit is now only halfway down. And what looks like this long lizard tail is sticking out of the storage unit. Whatever that was, I don't know how, but it seemed to have opened the door and was in there rooting through boxes, knocking stuff over. Now I had to drive by this unit again. I had no choice because I was pulled up at the end of an area that was a dead end. So I just stepped on the gas and flew by the unit in reverse, and I heard the creature let out this god-awful screech. I can still hear it. I somehow drove home, even though I was completely shaking. The guy from Facebook Marketplace is now nowhere to be found. I messaged him, texting him to Venmo. Nothing. And to this day, he has never returned my messages. I feel like, you know... Someone was playing a sick joke on me, or maybe I had somehow been tricked into being bait. I mean, that's how I felt, you know. 
The whole thing is strange. I know it makes no sense, but honestly, it happened and I needed to share it. As for that formula, it was totally sealed and just shy of expiring. I didn't have a choice but to feed it to my baby. And after that ran out, I figured evaporated milk might be just fine. But who knows what'll happen then. When my baby's old enough, maybe I'll tell her this story. It sure is crazy what we do for our kids. Oh yeah, and by the way, I don't use Facebook Marketplace for anything anymore. Way too risky. The world is an incredibly mysterious place, and my personal feelings are that there are forces at work that we can barely comprehend. And to be honest, I don't know that we need to understand them. I think we just need to live harmoniously with them. I'll tell you why I feel this way and what I know. What happened to me happened in 1965, when I was a newbie at my job. I was just 25 years old and working for the government in an organization that deals with supernatural and unexplained phenomena. The program was called Project Blue Book. You might have even heard of it. Our job was to investigate reports of UFO sightings to study and scientifically analyze data pertaining to the said unidentified objects. But no matter how much we investigated, there were some things that we couldn't explain. Things that we couldn't just write off as, say, a weather balloon or a mistaken identity. So one day, one of my colleagues came to me with a report that he couldn't close. It was multiple sightings of a strange creature in the woods near a small town in Maine. He didn't think it was a big deal, so he passed the file on to me. Now, one sighting alone wouldn't be enough to raise any eyebrows or elicit a response, but this creature had been seen by multiple people, and some claimed to even have seen it emerge from a small glowing object that descended from the sky. Surprisingly, I was eventually tasked with going to Maine to investigate it all, which is what leads me to this story. Once I got to Maine, I tracked down and talked to the witnesses, and they all described the same thing. Bright light in the sky that seemed to be following them. You could just tell by talking to them that it was genuine, that they were truly terrified, and some were scared for their safety, and it wasn't hard to see why. I tried to reason through an explanation as a natural phenomenon as best as I could, saying it was this or that and giving them the best scientific answer I could, which is what we always did with the witnesses. But something nagged at me. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this story than meets the eye. And this one really felt different somehow. Granted, I was new to the job, but this really felt different. So I did some digging, and honestly, what I found will stay with me forever. So I'll just give it to you straight. The government is hiding something. Basically, they know something, something big. They know about and are covering up an alien presence on our planet. While I was in Maine, I was out walking in the woods near where the sightings had been reported. I was using our detecting equipment and was getting some really strong readings. I was actually quite surprised by this. I followed the equipment, which pulled me nearer and nearer to the strong frequencies it was detecting, and I was now about two miles from my car. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that I would never have ventured to this area without the equipment. And that's when the equipment started reading frequencies I have never seen before. Of course, I cautiously continued, not knowing what to expect, and that's when my entire idea of the world changed. That's when I saw it. A creature, a small yet humanoid creature with big black eyes and weird, almost reptilian-looking skin. I knew instantly that I had successfully tracked an alien, and every cell in my body then knew that the sightings I had come there to investigate were real. This creature was crouching next to a rock, and the area next to the rock was basically devoid of much vegetation, and the ground was completely cleared. It was obvious that this was a purposeful cleaning out of the brush. I stood there contemplating my next move. I didn't know whether to or how to successfully approach it. 
I then wondered if I had arrived just before something was about to happen, given its proximity to this cleared area. But before I could make a decision on what to do next, it turned towards me, and then it did something I will never forget. It cocked its head, and it looked intensely at me. Not in a way that felt menacing, but in a way that felt curious. And in that moment, I knew that whatever this thing was, it was not here to hurt us. It was just curious, like a child. But I also knew that the government would never allow the public to know the truth about this thing. It stared at me for a long time, and I just stood there, staring back. It was almost as if we were communicating, but with silence and our eyes. I softened in those moments, and I didn't feel scared. But before I could act upon my now-relaxed feelings, there was this loud humming noise that lasted about two seconds, and a quick explosion of light. My eyes blinked, and then opened to those floating lights blocking my vision. You know, the kind that you get after you look at the sun. I looked around to find the creature, but I never did see it again. And now, I knew I had to make a decision. Should I report what I really saw, or return and write up a report like I always did? A report stating that the witnesses' sightings were all easily explainable with scientific data. I chose the latter. Somehow in those few seconds I had come to feel an empathy for that creature and I wanted to protect it. It was all clear to me now that the government was trying to track these things down, clandestinely track them, and keep them hushed, keep their existence from the public. So for all of these years I have kept what I saw a secret. I never even told my co-workers what I saw when I got back. All I can hope is that all is well with that curious little creature, and that it was able to return to its home, wherever that is, safely. Oh, and by the way, the truth is that I wasn't really in Maine, like I said above, and I'm not willing to share the real location. Let's just suffice it to say that I'm trying to keep my identity a secret. Even after all these 55 years have passed, this is still the most important thing that is. Hey Lilith, I'm always amazed at how people share some of their crazy stories with you. There's no doubt there's a lot to this world that we just don't understand. I've seen some strange things myself, and I finally got up enough courage to share something with you and your audience. It was the most disturbing thing I've ever experienced in my life. I'm a forest ranger at the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan. Working here is a dream job for me. When I was a kid, my parents used to bring us here for family vacations in the summer, and it's gorgeous. I love it. So it made sense for me to do my part to help preserve this wonderful environment. I don't remember seeing anything strange when I was a kid, but working here is a different story. I hear about weird experiences from visitors all the time, but I'd say that most of it is mistaken identity, like somebody thinking a bear is Bigfoot. But I know what I saw, and there's no mistaking it for a bear. It started with a call to the ranger station about an assault taking place at one of the campgrounds. Myself and another ranger, who I'll call Tom, drove out to see what was going on. What we found at the scene was something out of a horror movie. A man had gone crazy and was trying to kill his family. He was armed with a bowie knife and had his wife and child cornered, but the wife was able to hold him off with a hunting rifle. We pulled our guns and told him to drop his weapons, but he wouldn't comply. His wife was terrified, but she begged us not to shoot him. While Tom kept his gun ready, I pulled out a baton and disarmed and subdued the man. As I handcuffed him, he kept repeating this one word under his breath. Wendigo. Wendigo. It was creepy, and it sent a shiver up my spine. The cops arrived, and as they took a report from the woman, I overheard her say that they had been camping for a few days. Her husband had gone hunting by himself that day, but when he returned, he began acting strangely. He suddenly became withdrawn and started talking to himself claiming that he had seen a strange creature in the forest. When his wife tried talking to him about it, he lashed out at her. 
and their child was getting scared, and his wife demanded then that they leave, but he refused. Finally, he went berserk. He turned his attention on his wife and child. She thought that he was possessed and was convinced it wasn't him, saying that even his facial features had changed. The cops took the family to the police station, leaving Tom and me pretty shaken. Sure, I've had to break up disturbances and erratic behavior before, but nothing like this. I asked Tom if he had heard the man uttering the word Wendigo. He shook his head no, but I didn't believe him. I could tell he was scared. I've heard that the Wendigo is a Native American myth. I didn't think it was something anybody believes in in this day and age. It said the creature's capable of pulling people under its spell and driving them to insanity, murder, and even cannibalism. If I ever heard anyone speak of it, it was only as a campfire tale. Over the next couple of days, I became obsessed. I learned the woman and the child were safe, but as soon as the husband was driven out of the forest, it was like he snapped out of a trance, and he had no recollection of what he had done. I heard this through police friends, but strangely in the news, it was reported that the man had a mental health emergency. It seemed like someone was covering it up. I guess to protect the reputation of the National Forest or U.S. Forest Service. On my breaks, I looked at the trail cams where the family was camping. I tracked down the footage of the man hunting, and I saw something quite odd. At one point, he approached something off camera with his rifle aimed, but then he stopped, dropped the gun, and stood motionless, just staring at whatever it was. He wasn't facing the camera and was about 10 yards away, so I couldn't see his face. He literally stood there, rooted in place, for over three hours. As the sun began to set, he finally picked up his gun and walked away. A few minutes later, a shadowy, hulking figure darted across the trail. It was just fast, just a blur of motion. But I paused it and was able to make out something that looked like it walked out of a nightmare. What was most distinguishable was its head, a deer skull with 50-point antlers, five, zero. I counted them three times. I thought it was a mask, but the rest of the figure was skeletal as well. It had the legs of a deer, and its body was emaciated. Its arms were long and lanky with claws that also looked like antlers. I immediately told my supervisor and showed him the footage, but he said it wasn't what I thought it was and that I should just drop the subject. Something was up. He obviously wasn't telling me everything. I told Tom about it, but he didn't want to get involved. I forced him to look at the footage, but when I searched the database, it was gone. Everything involving that family had been erased. Tom simply said, sometimes it's best to leave well enough alone. I was confused, but then I was called in by my supervisor. He explained that this issue was sensitive and not something for the U.S. Forest Service to handle. It fell on the Native American tribes. The area where the family was camping was now off limits, and I was told to stay away until further notice. A month later, that camping area reopened. I heard from Tom that it had been cleansed. It was clear that this incident had roots deeper than I understood. And as Tom said before, Sometimes it's best to leave well enough alone. Hey Lilith, to say I'm a huge fan of your channel would be an understatement. I've been a truck driver for five years and I actually listen to it while I'm on the road. I never thought I'd be able to contribute something myself, but now that day has arrived. While I'm not 100% certain about what I saw, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that it was not of this earth. Let me start from the beginning. I'm an owner-operator and I schedule shipments through the same broker that I've used since I started. I got a call regarding an urgent load that needed to be transported from Long Beach, California to Amarillo, Texas. He was vague about the cargo and the company, which should have been the first red flag but I didn't think too much of it, and I agreed to the job. I arrived at the port of Long Beach, where I was directed to a pier that was cordoned off. There were a lot of black, unmarked vehicles and men in military uniforms with no ranks or insignia. 
I had to go through a rigorous security checkpoint where they thoroughly pat me down, checked my ID, did a background check, and also searched my truck. I have never experienced anything like this before, which should have been another red flag, but I figured it was too late to turn back now. And then here's where it starts to get strange. They wouldn't let me back in my truck, and instead, somebody else drove it away, and I was told that it would return with a loaded container already hitched. I told them I don't approve because I like to inspect the cargo and make sure it's properly loaded and secured, and I didn't want to be liable for anything, but they assured me that the container was sealed, and as long as the seal remained unbroken upon delivery, I wouldn't be responsible for anything. Well, it's not the first time I've driven a sealed container, so I shrugged it off and gave them the paperwork, but they refused to divulge what I would be transporting. It made me uncomfortable, but as I looked at the armed men around me, I didn't argue. They gave me other paperwork to sign, simply stating that the container was preloaded and sealed. They promised a sizable bonus in Amarillo if everything worked out. They knew this was unorthodox, but said not to worry, which only made me more curious. An hour later, they returned my truck with a shipping container, and I got out of there as fast as I could. As I drove, I kept replaying the events in my mind. What was in the container? Why hire an owner-operator for something so secretive? What shadowy organization did they belong to? Why armed men? Whatever it was, it was heavy. My imagination began to run wild. Hours later, about two or three in the morning, I was on the I-40 in Arizona approaching the border of Mexico. There was no one else on that lonely stretch of desert at that hour, and this is when the really crazy stuff began to happen. There was this flash of light in the sky, which I dismissed as lightning, but when it happened again, I realized it was actually coming from a nearby mountain and I swear I saw something shoot out of it and disappear into the sky. A round, bright object that moved at an incredible speed. I glanced out the window for a better look, and I almost drove off the road. Hovering above me was a black, triangle-shaped craft. It was hard to see in the darkness, but it blotted out the clear, starry sky, and it made no sound and followed me at my pace. It was huge easily the size of a football field. So I don't know why I thought I could outrun it, but I instinctively stepped on the gas. The next thing I knew, a glowing white object pulled up next to me, paused for a moment, and then zipped right past. Not sure how familiar you are with the Tic Tac UFOs reported by the Navy a few years ago, but that's what it looked like. Scared out of my mind, I glanced out the window again and saw that triangle craft still up above. And that's when another tic-tac circled my truck. It moved clockwise around me while maintaining the speed that I was driving, which was about 100 miles an hour. And then it shot straight up and disappeared. It defied all logic and physics. I focused on the road and finally pulled up to a truck stop near Gallup, New Mexico. I don't know how long I sat there before getting out, but it took a while to wrap my head around what happened. The triangle craft was nowhere to be seen. I have no idea how long it followed me before it disappeared. The only conclusion I could come to was that it was related to whatever was in that container. I continued on to Albuquerque, where I was supposed to take a 10-hour break, but I just wanted to dump this load. I kept going, and I finished the last leg to Amarillo without incident. I dropped off the container at a facility that had no markings and I was greeted there by more armed men in unmarked uniforms. They asked how the drive went, and if I encountered anything along the way, but I told them nothing happened. Pretty sure they didn't believe me, but they didn't say anything, and I didn't care. They drove my truck away, and an hour later returned it without the container. I was given a nice cash bonus, but the money meant nothing. I went to a nearby motel and crashed for several hours, and when I woke up, my arms and face were red with some kind of a rash. I went to a doctor, and he told me it was radiation burns. I'm taking time off while I heal, and I'm hesitant to go back to driving. Even if I do, there's one thing for sure. I am done taking jobs from that broker. 
This encounter takes place in upstate New York in 2017. I was driving back to school last week after a long weekend at home in the city. The sun had begun to set, and after about an hour, I found myself trailing behind this beat-up truck, going really slowly with only one headlight lit. It was the final stretch of the drive, and we were on a smaller country road that hadn't really seen too much development over the years. Even the houses you saw there were few and far between. Meanwhile, while I was stuck behind the truck, I had the most insane experience of my life. Ever. I know it for a fact. I know I saw a creature that shouldn't really exist run across the road in front of me. It was dark, but my headlights were illuminating the thing enough that I could see it clearly. It was covered in straight black fur and its eyes were glowing red in the night light. When it reached the other side of the road, it turned around, locked its eyes with mine and howled at me in this piercing tone that made all of the hair stand up on my back. Well, more like every hair on my body stood up. I will never forget that sound or the feeling that it gave me. I then said words that I can't really repeat here, and I hit the gas so I could pass the truck and get the hell out of the area. I definitely did not want to be driving slowly at that moment in time. But right after I passed the guy in the truck, he slammed on his brakes, and he stopped dead in the middle of the road, and he idled there with his hazards on. At this point, I was scared as hell and feeling trapped on that lonely road. I so wanted to get out of there and began speeding off into the darkness. Behind me, I could see that the driver had put his window down and was hanging out and yelling something at me. I drove a mile or so, but my mind was racing and my heart was pounding in my chest, and I had no idea what to do next. I was worried that the guy back there was in trouble or something, and so now I had to choose whether to just leave him there or double back and make sure he was okay, despite having just seen a creature and knowing that it was still back there. Well, I decided to do what any humane person would do in that situation. I stopped, turned my vehicle around, and headed back. I mean, what other choice did I really have? I couldn't have lived with myself if something bad had happened to that guy. Anyway, I had nearly reached back to the spot where the guy was when the creature jumped out at me, again with those glowing red eyes and razor-sharp claws. I was honestly the most scared I've ever been in my life right at that moment. The thing looked to me in that second like a werewolf, but I had no idea as it stood there on its hind legs, and then it came straight at my hood. I instinctively swerved to avoid it and then slammed on my brakes. It was then that I was able to closely see the creature's face as it stood there next to my car. It looked, well, indescribable, really. I don't really know how to describe it without sounding insane because stuff like that only really lives on TV, right? And also, it looked pissed off. It then spun around and sped off into the trees, but not before swiping at my car one more time as it passed by. And oh my god, were those claws scary. They were about three inches long, sort of curved like a hook, and razor sharp. I know how sharp because the scratches left on my car prove it. After I got over the shock, I decided it was time to call 911 and report this experience. The cops were there in about 15 minutes, and they were as confounded as I was as to what exactly I saw out there. But luckily, they seemed to act as if I was telling the truth about having seen it. But anyway, I'm sure they could tell by my body language that it wasn't a joke. I actually got to wondering if maybe I wasn't the first person to report a creature like this in this area, and that's why they didn't seem shocked. So, I asked them if anybody else had ever seen or reported anything. They said there were no reports of any wild animals near this area, but they did mention something about a strange report that had come in earlier in the day. Apparently, somebody was out hiking on the other side of these mountains and they got lost or hurt or something. I guess they heard a howl and started heading toward it and came across something that scared the crap out of them too. It didn't really sound like what I saw, but hey, who knows? Maybe I did get too close to some wild animal's den or something. 
Or maybe that thing was just protecting its territory after noticing how slowly we were driving. I'm still shaken up by this encounter, and to be honest, I'm not sure if I will ever drive those roads again. At least, not alone. As for the guy in the truck, I got to talking to him once the police got there. He had apparently stopped because his gears were slipping and he was trying to get my attention. I must say that he is lucky as hell that I came back because who knows what might have happened to him out there if I and the police hadn't showed up. I hate to even think about it. I mean, can you even imagine how scary this would have been if it had happened to you? Could have ended up much worse than it did, too. My encounter has left me completely shaken, but I can't help think of all the things that could have happened. Much worse things come to my mind but I've been trying to push them aside, and I'm just glad that it played out the way it did. Hey Lilith, I'm a police officer, and I even got my partner into listening to your channel. We actually listen to you on our breaks. Sometimes we see some unbelievable things, mostly of the human variety, but I do have a story that I thought your listeners might appreciate. I've never experienced anything paranormal before, and I don't scare easily. But the story I'm about to tell you is the strangest, creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. One night, my partner and I were on a dinner break in downtown L.A. We were eating street tacos in our car while we, you guessed it, listened to some of your videos. As we finished eating, we got a call from dispatch about a 911 emergency not too far from us. It was a 245, assault with a deadly weapon. The dispatcher told us that a terrified young woman called and said that two men were trying to kill her. So we put on the flashing red and blues, turned on the siren, and rushed over to an industrial area. The neighborhood is a bit sketchy, made up of warehouses and buildings, some of which are abandoned. I admit, it's a bit ominous at night over there, and transients wander around, but they mostly keep to themselves. We arrived at an old four-story brick building that looked like it hadn't been occupied in years. No one was around, no cars parked, nothing. We pulled out our flashlights and we checked the front entrance, but the door was locked. We did a quick scan around the perimeter of the building, and that's when I thought I heard something coming from inside up on the fourth floor. I shined my light on one of the windows, and I swear to God, I saw someone standing there. It looked like a woman, but it was hard to tell through the grimy glass. I called out to my partner, but when we looked back up, no one was there. Thinking this girl was in trouble, and with no time to waste, we ran around to the front. This time we were surprised that we found the door slightly ajar. We looked at each other confused because we were certain it was locked before. Not taking any chances, we drew our weapons and proceeded inside. The place was a mess. Trash strewn everywhere, walls spray-painted with graffiti, stained mattresses and bedding, and the pungent smell of body odor, urine, and feces. Moments after we entered, we heard this blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere upstairs. We ran up to the second floor and we could hear faint, whimpering sounds, but it was hard to tell exactly where they were coming from. My partner and I split up to check the various rooms, but we found nothing. We heard the unmistakable sound of a woman crying, but this time coming from the third floor. We bolted up the stairs, calling out to anybody that needed help, but we got no response. There was just the sound of crying. The third floor was dark with no signs of anyone and again my partner and I split up to investigate. I swore I heard crying coming from one of the rooms, but when I checked, nobody was there. And then I heard it coming from a room across the hall, but when I looked, it was empty too. I was getting frustrated, and I wondered if somebody was pranking us. And that's when I saw the silhouette of someone at the end of the hallway. I shined my light, but the figure disappeared around a corner. I chased after it, calling for my partner, but when I rounded the corner, it led to another empty room. My partner caught up with me, and I told him what I saw, and he confirmed that he was hearing and seeing things too. A loud banging sound made me jump, followed by the sound of footsteps, and it came from above us on the fourth floor. 
As we made our way cautiously to the stairwell, there was another scream, agonized like someone was being murdered. We sprinted up the stairs, weapons aimed, scanned the halls with our flashlights. We decided not to split up this time. We called out, but received no answer. We heard the scream again, and there was just something about it that sent shivers up my spine. It was coming from a room down the hall. As we got closer, the screams became louder. It was a woman begging for her life. We burst into the room, and the screaming abruptly stopped. It was empty. My partner and I looked at each other, confirming that it was this room we heard the sounds coming from. I walked to a dirty window and looked down below. This was the exact window where I thought I had seen someone when I was outside. None of it made sense. We searched the room, and it was clear that no one had been here for quite some time. While the other rooms had evidence of squatters, this one did not. As I stood there, trying to wrap my head around the situation, we heard that horrifying, disembodied scream again. And this time it was directly in my ear, as if someone was right next to me. It scared me so badly I nearly jumped through the ceiling. I looked at my partner, and we both hightailed it out of there. We collected ourselves outside, but we didn't say anything. We just didn't have the words. I stopped a transient pushing a cart and asked him if he had heard or seen anything. He said everybody knows to stay away from that building because it's haunted. Apparently a girl was killed there many years ago. I didn't do a good job of hiding how shook up I was, and he noticed, laughing at me as he went on his way. My partner said not to tell anybody at the station and he half-jokingly mentioned that we should take a break from your stories for a bit. I said, better yet, now we have something to share with her. Anonymously. I know that this is going to sound unbelievable and ridiculous, but I swear every word of it is true. I was 15 years old in 2013 when my parents sent me to the foothills of West Virginia to stay with my grandma for a while. I had been getting into a lot of trouble back home in Massachusetts, and they thought that some quiet time in the country with grandma would do me some good. However, being there wasn't doing me any good. I was bored to tears, and I was already planning what I was going to do the minute I got back home to my friends. I guess grandma could tell that I had a little spark of something mischievous in me because she woke me up one morning to tell me that I needed to get up and get ready because we were off to an all-day church function. I was miserable all day. It was hot out, and I was surrounded by a bunch of people I didn't know. Grandma kept pushing me to talk to one girl in particular, telling me that we'd be good friends. I don't know what made her think that, aside from the fact that we were relatively close in age. I could see that the girl and I had very little in common aside from our age and I could also see that she was as unimpressed with me as I was with her. Grandma then volunteered to stay late and help clean up. Of course, I had to stay too. The only saving grace was that the girl she sent me to talk to had actually been interesting. Once we got relaxed with each other, she got talking, telling me these crazy stories about a local monster called the Mothman. The girl's name was Gwen, and she hadn't ever seen the Mothman herself, but she had heard a few long-winded tales from her uncles about times that they had spotted the thing down in the hollers, as she called them, and the riverbeds surrounding town. According to her uncles and told to me by way of her, the thing was anywhere between six and ten feet tall, had glowing red eyes and a wingspan at least as wide as its height. She said most commonly people would catch it out flying at night, swooping down at cars on the back gravel roads. I didn't believe her, of course. To me, it was just a little bit of folklore, but it didn't get lost on me that Grandma's house was on a back gravel road. So I'd be lying if I said she didn't succeed in spooking me, at least a little bit. As it started to get darker out that night, I found myself getting more and more nervous about the drive home and I started to urge Grandma to hurry things along. By this time, we'd been at the church for well over eight hours, and she had finished the cleaning and was now sitting having coffee, chatting with the pastor's wife, and catching up on the local happenings, 
as if there wasn't another care in the world. Finally, she picked up on my urgency to leave, and we made our way out to the car. I could tell she was a little annoyed with my impatience, and she snarked back at me, What has gotten into you? I didn't want to tell her, of course, that the Mothman stories were what's getting to me. As we started home, though, she brought the creature up herself. You know, she said, it's best we took off anyway. We should have left earlier, probably. The Mothman is usually out on clear nights like this. I faked my best scoff and pretended not to know what she was talking about. But then she told me that she had overheard Gwen telling me about it. And then she proceeded to tell me that she had seen it herself at least three times. Now, my grandma was a God-fearing, traditional, straight-laced old lady. There is no way in the world she would tell a lie. So at this point, I started to get extra worried. And I know you won't believe this part of the story, but it's almost as if the thing knew we were talking about it. Because right when Grandma stopped telling me about her third sighting, she slammed on her brakes and screamed. This, of course, is where my heart started beating out of my chest. A screaming Grandma caught my attention, and I looked ahead at the road to see what caused it. And there it stood. It looked dark gray under the light of the headlights, and it was standing motionless in the road, staring at us. I didn't even have to utter the words and ask if it was what I thought it was. I just looked over at Grandma, and she nodded, and put out her arm, silently telling me to sit back and stay quiet. I wasn't about to argue with her, so I did exactly what she said, and that's when this hulking creature leaned forward, as if it was peering in through the windshield at us, with its red, piercing eyes, and then it opened its mouth and let out an ear-piercing screech. As it screeched, I watched as its wings spread out, followed by it taking this giant leap and then flying over us and straight up over the trees that lined the road. With the road now clear ahead of us, Grandma jammed her foot on the gas and we got home quicker than I ever thought she could drive. And we ran as fast as we could into the house, slamming the door shut behind us. The next week, my parents came to get me. It was time for the visit to come to a close anyway. And when I got back to Massachusetts, I was a completely different kid. I stayed out of trouble. I listened to my parents. I did everything I was told. And let me tell you that I now have a new fascination with Grandma and what she is capable of doing. Don't get me wrong, I love Grandma. It's just that before this, I only thought of her as older and slower. Either way, I don't ever want to be sent back to West Virginia to face that thing again. Grandma will just have to come to our house. When I started attending college in Boston, I spent my freshman year in the dorms. It was a valuable experience overall, but it just wasn't for me. I didn't realize what an introvert I was until I was surrounded by people and activity 24-7. So... I decided to find an apartment for my second year. After looking a bit, I finally found someone who seemed compatible who was looking for a roommate. The place was a little further from the college than I liked, but I decided to go with it. Before I signed the lease, my roommate told me that the building was built on the site of an old mental hospital. She said she wanted me to be fully informed ahead of time. I guess I thought it was a nice gesture, but also wondered if I would have been better off not knowing that. I asked her if knowing that information had affected her anyway. She said not really, but sometimes she got these strange feelings when going in and out of the building, and that she had also heard some weird sounds on occasion. I didn't believe in that kind of stuff, so I just kind of shrugged it all off. I was just happy to be out of the crazy party atmosphere at the dorm. Too many freshmen apparently had been overprotected in high school and they were going crazy without their parents around. Not my kind of thing. Anyway, there were a few other students living in that building, so we got a group together for carpooling back and forth to school. One evening, we had all decided to go out to dinner. Two of us were waiting in the lobby for the rest of the group to get downstairs. And as I was just standing there looking around the lobby, since I never really stopped there much, 
I noticed that there was this door near the front door, and it was a bit open. I mean, I assumed it was like a closet door or something, even though it wasn't labeled. And I'd never seen it open before, which is what caught my eye. Anyway, I went over to take a peek inside since it was open, and it turns out it wasn't a closet. It was a stairway. I called to my friend who was waiting with me. We looked down into the darkness, but there was no light switch at the top to turn on. We then looked at each other and said, what the hell? And we both headed down the stairs. We walked down slowly, me going first, feeling along the wall the entire way. Eventually, I felt a light switch at the bottom, and I flipped it on. Part of me didn't expect it to work, so I was pleasantly surprised when it did. We stopped and looked straight ahead, both of us looking into what looked like the entrance to a tunnel. Now, that really surprised us, but right then we heard the others upstairs in the lobby, and we agreed that we didn't have time to check it out right then. So we headed back up the stairs and found the others waiting there and we told them about the stairway and how it was at the bottom. They all agreed that we should check it out when we got back. So we headed out and spent a few hours out eating and talking about school, then headed back home. So when we got back, since we had all agreed, we decided to head down the stairs and check out the tunnel. So all five of us went down together to explore. We followed the tunnel for a while, and then we came out into what looked like a hospital room but like a really old one, not modern at all. There were hospital beds and bedpans and a variety of hospital equipment, but all really old-style stuff, like metal, no plastic anywhere. We found a closet full of straitjackets, too, and in fact, we only knew what they were from seeing them in movies. None of us had ever seen one in person before. It was all very strange and giving us a creepy feeling, But in addition, there was something out of place, even though I couldn't exactly understand what it was right then. But then it dawned on me, even though the instruments were old, a lot of them were laid out on trays and they looked really clean, like someone was getting ready to use them. And on one of the counters, I found a note that said, give 300 milligrams if you have any problems. I wasn't sure what that was all about, but I was thinking that 300 milligrams could be a lot, depending on what it was. Then there were all these wheelchairs lined up along the walls, and there was a bicycle down there, but it didn't look old. It wasn't dusty at all. We wandered around, not knowing what to think of it all, sort of in total surprise and taking it all in. There were a lot of rooms. It sort of seemed abandoned, and yet the electricity worked in all the rooms. Finally, we got to a far room, and when we opened the door, it smelled terrible. My friend reached around and flicked on the light, and instantly we noticed what looked like huge paw prints on the walls. I don't know anything about animal tracks, but these were too big to belong to anything average-sized. And then there was an examination table in there, and there was blood on the walls. This room really freaked me out. I was imagining something trying to escape from that room. Like there had been a fight, and that had caused the handprints on the walls. And then I think what really freaked me out, too, was that smell, and it seemed kind of fresh. Then I heard one of my friends shouting, and I ran towards his voice. He had gone all the way down to the far end of the hallway, and had reached the place where the tunnel resumed. I heard this loud growling coming from where he was, and when I approached, I could see this gate with iron bars closing off the tunnel. Looking further, I could see that there was some kind of a beast behind the gate, and it started howling and snarling and throwing itself against the bars. It looked incredibly angry, and it was trying to break down the gate. I wondered if it thought we were part of the people who had put it behind there. And its teeth were incredible. I swear it had a double row of teeth and horrible fangs. It was standing upright, and it was massively hairy, but I couldn't even figure out if it was an animal or demon, or even mutant human. It had a short snout and a big humped back. It was over six feet tall, but not much more. And the smell was unbearable now that we were closer, like rotting meat. We stared at each other, none of us saying much, just breathing heavy, and finally I yelled, let's get out of here. 
We ran back towards the stairs and the lobby, back past all the rooms and back through the tunnel until we finally reached the stairway. We stopped there and all I could say was, what the hell? My roommate was like, what are we going to do? We ended up back in the apartment, thought about who we should call. We figured at this hour only the police would respond, so we ended up calling them. When they arrived, the two officers headed down the stairway and they were gone for at least 20 minutes or more. All we could hear down there was them calling out, hello, but nothing else. Eventually, they both came back up looking like they had seen a ghost. Then they taped everything off and took all of our information, all five of us. They then sent us back upstairs and said that they would finish off and get a hold of us later. But we never heard from them again. We've tried to access a police report about that night, but we can't get anything. We're told that someone will get in touch with us about it, but we're never called. We've tried going to the station ourselves to get it, but everything just leads to a dead end. Oh, and by the way, that door, it is always shut and padlocked now. Some of us have given up and have moved on, but me, I need to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to keep trying to get some answers. Hi, Lilith. My name is Donna, and I'm writing in about a strange occurrence at my current job. It seems like a lot of people wait a while before talking about this stuff, but I just need to get it off my chest and see what you and your followers think. I've been having a hard time sleeping lately, and I can't decide what I should do or if I should even do anything at all. About two months ago, I started working at a dermatopathology lab as one of the lab techs. It's a pretty easy job. For anyone not familiar with the sector, basically we analyze skin for diseases, fungi, cancers, etc. I was hired when a previous lab tech went on maternity leave, so my contract with the lab is for six months. This is a small, privately owned lab on the East Coast. Pretty rare since Quest is huge now and gets most of the work. But some doctors still pay for specialized services or an actual human eye on specimens. My job consists of intake and the initial sectioning of the specimens before they're put into slides for the specialists to look at. Prior to this, I'd hopped around a few small labs throughout the state, but this lab isn't like any other. I don't mean that in a good way either. It's pretty run down. From what I've been told, the owner and head specialist have owned the building since the early 90s. He's in his 60s now, but has no plans to retire, which he says constantly. There's supposedly a maintenance company that keeps up the place, but I haven't seen them once. The parking lot is pitted with potholes, panels in the ceiling are missing, two of the four toilets don't work, and the furnace won't turn on this week when they tested it. Like I said, the lab is small, so there are only eight other lab techs. I've pried a little bit to see if anybody thinks this is odd, but the only answer I get is that it pays well, and I should just keep my head down. I've been working Monday through Friday every week, but I got called in this past Saturday due to a tech being unexpectedly out. They needed someone to process the specimens that had arrived Friday morning, and I lived the closest, so I headed in. After punching in my alarm code and locking the door behind me, I headed down to the lower level of the building. There's only one room down on that floor that's actually used for lab work. The rest of the floor is very maze-like, with rooms opening to other rooms, no real hallways, and stacks upon stacks of old medical records. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of violations going on, but I'm not a whistleblower, and I only have four months left on this contract. So on this particular Saturday, I hunkered down in the lab room and I got to work. I'd made it about two hours in when I heard this thudding sound. There were so many machines around that I assumed it was just that, but then I realized that it wasn't rhythmic, and it sounded human-made. I tensed, thinking somebody had gotten into the building or was trying to. I pulled out my cell phone and got the emergency number ready, but decided to at least check out my section of the downstairs. There's an exit door a few feet behind the room I work in, so at least I could easily escape if something weird was up. And the sound was definitely coming from this floor. 
I would have heard anybody coming down the stairs, but I hadn't. So whatever was making that noise was already in the building when I got there. So stepping out into the single hallway, I looked up and down before deciding my best bet was to stop outside each door and listen. The first two doors didn't sound like the thudding was coming from in there. But when I reached the third door, the sound stopped for a moment before continuing. I passed the tiny kitchen and break room and I reached the door that I remembered was the owner's library. The thudding was coming from inside that. And now I could hear scratching, too. I hesitated for a second before pushing the door open and flipping the light on quickly. Inside the room, it was empty, except for stacks and stacks of journals and books. But across the room and on the other wall was another door. I stepped through the piles of journals, the hair on the back of my neck standing up, and I listened at the door. The thudding and scratching was coming from inside. Double-checking that I had the emergency number up, I quietly pushed the door open. It looked like a normal door, but I was surprised by how insanely heavy it was. The room inside was shadowed with narrow windows up near the ceiling, but it was enough light that I could see a cage on a table in the middle of the room. The cage was about four feet by four feet, and inside was something that I can only describe as a huge anteater digging at the corner of the cage with its curved, scaly back turned towards me. My first thought was that, for some reason, somebody had left this thing in here by mistake. But what on earth was it? And who would do that? I got closer to it, and when it turned around, I saw that it had a face similar to a monkey. I stumbled back, and the creature turned quickly towards me, baring its teeth. None of this made any sense at all, like, what was this thing, and why was it in here? let alone why was it in a cage in a lab over the weekend. I stepped out and shut the door quickly, trying to process what I had just seen. Were they running experiments on this creature? It was definitely a crossbreed of some kind, not natural in any way. I quickly went back to the lab room and I packed it all in. I just left without doing any more work. On Monday, I did go back to work and the lab supervisor gave me a hard time about not finishing on Saturday. But I said there had been a family emergency. So now it's been four days, and I'm still thinking about that creature. Do I say something to someone? Do I ask about it? Or is it a secret? Nobody else has mentioned the caged creature in that room, and I'm scared that I might have stumbled on something that I shouldn't have. At this point, I don't know what to do or if I should check if it's still down there. Someone has to be feeding it and taking care of it, but I don't have a very good feeling about what they're doing to it. Hi, Lilith. I appreciate you returning my email so quickly. I couldn't find it at first because somehow it got mixed up and was sent to my spam folder. I have had several types of experiences and encounters, and this one happened while I was at work. It happened sometime around 2015. I was working at my tribal casino in the housekeeping department. When most people think of housekeeping, they think of housekeepers from the hotels and motels, but it's a different way when you work at a casino. As a housekeeper at a casino, you're divided into sections throughout the casino. We are responsible for certain sections of the casino. We keep the floors clean, continuously disinfect the slot machines, chairs, and spaces between every slot machine. Some people are responsible for the bathrooms, and that's it. Well, there are many more departments that we help keep clean, but you get the gist of it, right? We also help guests when they have questions and need help. Other times, we put a placeholder for guests when they step away to use the bathroom or get something to eat. I thoroughly enjoyed working with my housekeeping team because they were a lot of fun. As a social butterfly, too, I enjoyed listening to all the stories that our guests shared with me. This one evening, while I was pushing my cart that held our large garbage can and cleaning supplies, I was walking down this side aisle. Slot machines all around me with guests laughing and screaming and intently staring at their screens. Some guests were tapping their slot machines for good luck. 
There are so many rituals that I witnessed, and each seemed to work for that guest. Because many people were winning, and occasionally I would hear them screaming with happiness and joy, secretly I would hope and wish that every person in my section won big. And I would also silently pray for those people who needed extra money to make it to the end of the month, or to make the rent this month, or who had children that needed something special or important. I don't know if my prayers helped anyone win or not, but secretly I hoped they did. So this one evening, as I was walking towards my section, there's this one guest sitting at the corner aisle in the inside of her row. She was average looking, a little overweight, and had chestnut brown hair. It hung just past her shoulders, too, and her feet reached the floor perfectly. She was sitting there tapping the screen of her slot machine, and she was a short distance away from me. She had on loose-fitted blue jeans and a black jacket. And as I was walking towards my section, there was this strange energy within me. Like, it's difficult to explain. It's an energy that I felt before. Nothing scary or anything. The energy feels like a ball of warmth within my chest and then up to my head, too. It was hypnotizing. Because as I was walking towards my section, my gaze was focused on that lady sitting at the end slot machine tapping her screen for good luck. Now, naturally, we all blink, right? So when I blinked and opened my eyes again, the woman was no longer sitting in her chair. But I'm walking still, and my gaze is still upon the lady, but she's now high up in the air. And I'm not great with numbers, so I don't know how high she was in the air but she was out of reach for anybody who would want to try to pull her down, but close enough that I could still see every detail about her. So imagine this. I'm walking and pushing my cart, and this woman is sitting there at the end slot machine while tapping away at her screen. And then this energy comes from within me that is warm, and I know something out of the ordinary is about to happen, because that warm feeling and that buzz within my chest is strong. That's when I blinked, and as I opened my eyes, that woman was now in the sitting position facing me, and she's about halfway between the floor and the ceiling. But now she is this beautiful being that's pure white, and she has long, silvery white hair that reached just past her waist, and these beautiful crystallized blue eyes that makes up most of her face, and the energy that I feel within me is warm and comforting. Now she's just looking at me. And there's this electric white light all around her, too. And there are different hues of blue and green that are in the center. While I was looking up at her, I don't know if I was still walking or not. It happened so quickly, too. I don't know how long she was there. I don't know how long I was gazing at her, either. But when I came back to myself, I was about four or five rows of slot machines in front of her. And I turned to look back and she was gone. I looked all around me, too, to see if anybody else had noticed this, and everybody was still engaged in their own lives of gambling and drinking and listening to music, eating and having fun. After I finished my section where this all happened, I began to walk to the other side of the casino where my second section was, and as I was wiping down the open slot machines, just on the other side was that woman again, but now she was the same brown-haired woman with the blue jeans and the black jacket. And before I could react, I swear she sent me a message telepathically. She said, thank you for doing your job. I appreciate you. When she sent me that message, it was like a movie was playing in my mind. But it was her telling me, thank you for doing your job and I appreciate you. It was cool. I nodded. And then in my mind, I said, you're welcome. For some reason, I'm certain she heard me. And as I reached for the garbage can that was at the end of her slot machine, she was gone. Growing up, I always wanted to be a nurse. So, right out of high school, I attended Loyola University in New Orleans to pursue my nursing degree. After graduation, I applied to every opening I could find in the area. I was only 22, and I felt like I could save the world. The first interview I got was at a nursing home. I sort of had the idea that nursing homes were sad places. 
I mean, I was close with my grandparents, and it was hard to imagine what it would be like for them to leave their home and live in a facility. I thought of all the comfort and cheer I would be able to bring to the place. So without much further thought, I took the job and was excited to start working. I was stationed on the third floor, and I know that this might sound depressing, but the third floor was the floor for residents who weren't expected to last much longer. Most of them had an Alzheimer's diagnosis. There were such a variety of people there. Some were sweet and quiet. Some were sad. Some seemed to be stuck in the past and didn't know where they were. And one guy, George, was really belligerent. Whenever it was time for his personal care, we needed two or three people to be in the room to manage him. He didn't really realize we were even there to help him, and he'd swing his arms out and try to strike out at us. One time he really clocked me good in the shoulder and sent me stumbling across the room. I loved talking to the residents who were coherent. Even if they didn't totally understand where they were, they were able to share some amazing stories. And it also seemed that they really enjoyed telling them. There was this one lady who I was really curious about. Her name was Evelyn. She seemed to be really attached to her faith, and whenever we would serve meals, she would stand up and start praying. It was actually hard to get her to settle down and eat. I think she thought that the other residents were part of her congregation or something, since they were all assembled in a dining room. I'm not sure what religion she was following, but she was very devoted. I would try to converse with her, but she would always respond with something pretty hard to understand. There were also special instructions in her chart on how to handle her in the event of her death. She had a DNR order, which means do not resuscitate. We weren't allowed to do any CPR or anything. If something happened to her, she was to be allowed to die a natural death. Now, that wasn't unusual. A lot of people on the third floor had DNRs. But we were also not allowed to touch her after her death or do any post-mortem care. We also knew that in the event of her death, we were to contact the family and that they would come and prepare the body on their own. Apparently, they had this special way of doing things. But she actually seemed to be one of the most fit residents we had, so I didn't anticipate her dying anytime soon. She actually seemed to get more energetic, especially at mealtimes, and recently it seemed that her praying was getting louder. Now, this would have been fine, but then she started agitating the other residents. Many of them were nonverbal, but they would start to moan or rock back and forth and look anxious and upset. They didn't understand what was going on with her loud voice. Sometimes George especially would get worked up and start swinging at people, and then we couldn't get near him to feed him. So sometimes we had to have Evelyn eat in her room. She hated the overhead fluorescent lights, so her room was lit with a few battery-powered globes. They were round and glowing, but didn't give much light. There was an ornate mirror on her dresser, and it looked like a very old antique. And the problem with having her eat in her room was that she insisted on standing in front of the mirror for her praying at mealtime. It just made it hard to get her to eat. But somehow our staff managed to keep everybody semi-happy and fairly well-fed in spite of all the different needs we had. So one evening, I sent a CNA, a nursing assistant, to bring Evelyn out for dinner, but it wasn't long before the CNA rushed back to the station and said Evelyn was lying in her bed and appeared to have died. I managed to catch the medical director before she left for the day. She came and confirmed the death, so I called the family right away to let them know. The family arrived within the hour. They gathered around the bed and washed the body with special products they had bought, and then they began to wrap the body in a shroud made of silk while they prayed. I stood to the side, trying to be inconspicuous, but also available if they needed anything. And the way her mirror was angled, I could see what they were doing from the doorway by the reflection. Their praying got louder, and suddenly there was this huge release of what sounded like breath come from the body. And then, in the mirror, I watched as the image of Evelyn floated up into the corner of the room, up to the ceiling level. But then my eyes shifted to look directly there, and I couldn't see her. I could only see her reflection in the mirror. She was just faintly visible, but it was definitely her. 
I looked back and forth and could see her in the mirror every time. And then I could see her looking down and watching everything. When that gasp of breath happened, one of the family members opened the window, and then they all started waving silk scarves around the room. And Evelyn, or whatever you call it, her spirit, or whatever, drifted out the window. I honestly don't think her family could see this. They weren't watching the mirror, and in fact, most of their eyes were closed. At that point, I was just gobsmacked. Needless to say, I wasn't expecting to see something like that at all. After the family left, I went and sat in the nurse's station with my mind racing, and I tried to talk myself into thinking that I had imagined the whole thing. But in the end, I knew what I saw. And let's just say that I now have a whole new view on life and death and dying. Hi, Lilith. I love hearing all the stories from your listeners, and I had this weird experience about 25 years ago that I wanted to get an opinion on. It wasn't as terrifying as some of your stories, but we lived with it for quite a while, and I wouldn't want to experience it again. I was a happy kid when I was little. My family lived near Chicago in the North Kenwood area. We had your average family life. My dad went to the office every day, and my mom stayed home with us. I liked my school and my friends, and on weekends my parents would take us on fun little outings, and we always had what we needed. But when I was about 10 years old, my parents ended up getting a divorce. It was really out of the blue for us kids, and my mom had to move us to a neighborhood that wasn't as nice. She rented a house there, and we spent most of our time with her. The house felt weird to me from the beginning. There was something odd and uncomfortable about the vibe there. We tried having people over like we used to at the old house, but it seemed like people didn't like hanging out there for any length of time. Just a weird feeling. Also, it felt cold all the time. Even in the summer, if you walked in the house, you would just get chilled right away. Now, that isn't the worst thing, I guess, since we didn't have air conditioning. But in the winter, It didn't seem to matter how high the furnace was up. The heat couldn't seem to penetrate. My mom had the furnace checked out, but they said it was fine. There was also a wood-burning fireplace in the living room that we would usually use when it got really cold, but you would have to sit right next to it if you wanted to keep warm. And nobody ever wanted to go into the basement. I used to try to go down there when I needed to get something, but I would usually get spooked halfway down and run back up. Can't really explain why. I felt like I was going somewhere I didn't belong. Nobody liked it down there. My mom had the washer and dryer hooked up in the kitchen so she wouldn't have to go down there to do the laundry. From the outside, the house looked fine. I mean, it wasn't like my mom had decided to rent a creepy looking house. It actually was one of the better looking houses on the block. We only noticed the strangeness when we started living there. My good friends would come over sometimes, but when I would ask them to spend the night, they never wanted to. At my old place, we would have sleepovers all the time. So then one night, when I had been asleep, I woke up to the feeling of somebody standing over my bed. I didn't really feel scared or creeped out or anything, but when I opened my eyes and looked around, I really saw someone. It was this lady with curly brown hair. She was pretty tall, and she looked like one of my mom's friends, so in my sleepy state, I thought it was her. She did have weird clothes on, though. She was wearing an apron, too, which we never had aprons around. But when I told my mom the next day, she said her friend had definitely not been visiting. She said I was probably just dreaming, but I knew it wasn't a dream. And then there was this time when my mom was at work and the babysitter was with us. We were just sitting on the couch watching TV. And then it started to snow, and the babysitter went to put more wood on the fire. When she did that, she looked out the window and made this surprised sound and said, Who's that lady on the porch swing? My sister and I jumped up to look, but we didn't see anybody out there. The swing was moving, but it could easily have been the wind because it was really starting to pick up. But the babysitter's description of the woman was the same as mine a curly haired lady with an apron no coat or anything. We all went back and were sitting on the couch, sitting there for a while when the doorbell started ringing. 
but incessantly, over and over. And when the babysitter opened the door, nobody was there. There weren't any footsteps in the snow. We all decided it was just pranksters and went back to watching TV, even though that made no sense with no footprints. But that was that, at least at that point. After that, things started to go missing in the house, just random little things, like my mom's hairbrush. She would always brush her hair at night and leave her brush on the dresser, but then it disappeared for a long time, and my mom eventually found it on top of the refrigerator. A totally ridiculous place. And then my school shoes that I always kept in my bedroom closet ended up inside the stereo cabinet. It was all kinds of strange things like that. They were harmless little things, but annoying and strange. And it made us get into so many arguments and fights because we were always blaming each other for the missing stuff. And then one night, my mom was going up the staircase to go to bed when she glimpsed a lady emerging from out of nowhere and walking towards her. My mom screamed and slipped and fell to the ground. Of course, we kids came out of our rooms to check. But when we got out there, she was sitting on the floor looking pale. And mom said she had felt this woman walk right into her, or basically through her. And she described the woman as having curly hair and an apron. She said it felt like ice cold air was sinking into her flesh. So now this is getting really weird and we are all really creeped out. I was really scared because I was worried mom was going to be possessed by that lady or something. Eventually things ended up dissipating after my mom saw the lady, but we would still periodically lose items only to find them in the strangest locations a few days later. My mom got over it, or at least I should say she seemed fine to me, but I was younger, so who really knows? Anyway, it still makes me shudder to think about all of this, and I'm wondering if there are many people living with something like this, like I am. Like, not something really terrible, but a weird, low-level presence, something like that. It's so uncomfortable. Anyway, I'm really glad I wasn't the only one in the house who experienced all of that, or I would just feel totally crazy. Thanks, Lilith, for being here and being a place that I can share this. I'm a teacher in western Pennsylvania, a few hours north of Pittsburgh in Clarion County. I've been seeing some strange things lately, and I'd really love to share my story, because I'm stumped for an explanation right now. Like I said, I live in western PA with my family. We're technically in a suburb, but our area is pretty woodsy. And once you cross the highway, you're basically cut off from civilization. Our high school, middle school, and grade school are all on the same plot of land. I'm a science teacher for the high school, and my daughter is in fifth grade. Sometimes she'll come and hang out in my office during lunch. So, these incidents started back in February. My daughter said some of her classmates saw an animal in the woods around the school. Of course, the playground area is fenced in, and so I wasn't super concerned. What they said they saw was a giant lizard, and all the kids agreed that it had to be as big as a car. Now, as a teacher, I'm supposed to report any credible animal sightings to the administration offices, because you never know what's out there. I mean, we have dealt with a black bear that got too close a few years ago, some unruly deer and things like that. And I know that my daughter knows that these allegations will be taken seriously, and she's not the kind of kid that makes stuff up. So I believe her when she says they all saw a reptile of some kind. I just think the kids are exaggerating how big it was. So I didn't make a formal report right away, but I rather started with just giving the other teachers a heads up in case any rumors started getting around. I'm thinking the kids will talk about it for a day or two and then it'll pass. But a few days later, some of the high school teachers said that they've gotten reports from the high school students. Apparently, some kids were at school after dark for rehearsals, and they saw something wandering around the edge of campus. It walked on two legs, so they thought it might be someone who had gotten lost. But when they started to walk over to the edge of the fence, one of them saw that it had claws and scales. Some of the students were claiming it was either a hoax, or some were even saying that it was somebody's pet Komodo dragon that had escaped, which of course isn't possible, 
but I think they were just trying to rationalize the thing they saw in any way they could. And of course, the teachers are thinking it's just some kind of a high school kid's prank that's going on. But I don't know, because something about it just set me on edge. It felt weird that my daughter's friends had just seen this thing, too. And I really didn't think anybody was running around pretending to be a giant lizard. But it was so unbelievable. It just seemed that it wasn't a prank, if that makes sense. Then a week or so later, I had to drive in early on Monday because I was on bus duty. It was about seven in the morning and the road up to the school was mostly empty. I had my headlights on because it was pretty foggy out, too. And then as I got closer to the school, I started to see movement in the trees on the side of the road. I just caught a quick glimpse, and I thought maybe it was just an animal, a deer or something. But I could have sworn that it was gray. It was moving pretty fast. So I looked away and then looked back, and it was gone. I didn't see it cross the road, so I figured it must have just gone back into the woods. Anyway, I slowed down just in case because I didn't want to hit it. And I looked over to the side of the road again, and when I looked forward, a deer had run out in front of me. I slammed the brakes too hard and I swerved towards the forest. While the car was swerving, though, I caught the thing again in my headlights. And when my headlights hit it, it stood up like a human. But its eyes were yellow and it had this huge, scaly head. The thing hissed at me. I saw its huge teeth, and then it ran away when it saw my car was aiming for it. This all happened in a split second, and it left me very shook up. I didn't hit the creature, but I wish I had. When I saw it, I was glad I hadn't brought my daughter with me that day because I wouldn't have wanted to freak her out any more than I was at that moment. I pulled back onto the road and continued heading to the school. I was really confused by what I saw, but I knew that my mind hadn't created it. But I also knew that there was no way I could make a report without people thinking I was crazy. The best I could do was tell my daughter not to ever go in the woods around the school. And like I said before, she's a good kid, so I knew she would listen. I hoped that would be the end of it all, but then a few weeks later, the cafeteria got broken into. Since our school is small and all the grades use the same cafeteria, there's enough food in there for a couple hundred people. Someone had broken in and gotten into the fridge, and they left a horrible mess behind, including foods strewn everywhere and liquids spilled everywhere. It was disgusting. I volunteered to help with the cleanup, though. By the time this happened, talk of the reptile creature had all but completely dissipated, and we figured it was just vandalism. But then the same vandalism started happening in town, too. The grocery stores and the delis were broken into. It was the strangest thing. We even had to call a town hall meeting about it because everybody was suspicious of everybody else, thinking that somebody must know something. But honestly, I got to thinking that maybe it was that lizard creature that I saw. Because the kids were right. It was huge. I didn't know whether to speak up or not. It didn't seem like anybody else was seeing it around anymore. Not even the students. I wondered if it had become fully nocturnal after the previous incidents. Or maybe it was smart enough to hide, which, in and of itself, is super scary. And things did get pretty bad for a while. We have a lot of hunters in our town, and one of our neighbors lost a season's worth of venison from a freezer in their shed. I personally think the lizard thing is a scavenger. And once it picked our town clean, it just moved on because one day the break-ins stopped completely. Maybe the thing moved on and is harassing people somewhere else by now. But I haven't heard any news of anything, so who knows? Like I said before, I wish I would have hit it with my car. Hey Lilith, thanks for your show. Since hearing other people's stories, I've worked up the courage to tell my own and I know somebody out there will believe what seems unbelievable to most people. Before I saw this for myself, I thought anyone saying they saw a creature like this was absolutely lying. So, here it is. A few years ago, in the springtime, we had just broken ground for a new home in rural Maine. It's what would be our vacation home. Close to ski slopes, a river, and a lake where we could bring the kids fishing, maybe even ice fishing, in the winter. 
It took about 10 minutes to get to the closest store, which was a mom and pop convenience store that sells gasoline, sandwiches, slushies, small groceries, things like that. At the time, that was the closest store if you wanted to get somewhere to eat. Otherwise, it was like a 45-minute drive to the next big town that had McDonald's, KFC, and stuff like that. So when the construction crews were starting to frame the house, I would be over there pretty much every few days to see how things were going, and I would always bring them lunch. Usually I grabbed a few subs and sodas, but on this particular day when I walked into the mom-and-pop place, I saw a sign that they were now offering fresh pizza. It already smelled amazing in there, and it was still a little cool out early spring, so I thought something hot for lunch would be great. I ordered a large pepperoni and a large deluxe with lots of sausage, grabbed some Cokes, then put the pizza in my car and headed to the lot. When I got there, the guys were working hard. They looked up and waved, looked at their watches. It's a little early for lunch, so I just hung out for a few minutes. Then we sit in random places around the lot to eat, mostly on tailgates and on a couple of big rocks at the edge of the lot. There's basically nothing but woods in every direction. Everyone says, The pizza's good, so good choice there. So right about the time we finished eating, it starts to rain, like really come down. Clouds were expected that day, but the rain was a big surprise. The foreman starts swearing and tells the guys they'll wait it out for a bit. The guys scramble to get tools out of the rain, put them in their trucks. Everybody just sits in their cars and trucks while the rain beats down. And then pretty soon, it's obvious that's it. But pretty soon it's obvious that it's going to be way too wet and muddy, so the foreman tells the guys to just wrap it up for the day. Everyone drives off. I sit there for a little longer, waiting for the rain to let up because I really needed to pee. But there's just no break in the rain, it's just pouring. So I figure I'll dash to the edge of the woods, pee as quickly as I can, and run back to the truck. I'm instantly soaked. I trudged a few yards into the woods and stopped because there's too much brush to go any further. I figured nobody is around anyway, so I unzip and pee behind a tree. Then as I'm finishing, I hear this sloshing sound of somebody coming towards me. I turn to see who came back, thinking somebody had forgotten something, but there, at the opposite side of the lot, and next to the half-framed house, there is this huge, hairy creature. Like... I'm talking Bigfoot. I'm completely not kidding. It is 100% a Bigfoot. I mean, unless it was the most realistic costume in the world. Like a Hollywood, world-class makeup artist slipped into the woods of rural Maine and was screwing with me. But I know it wasn't a costume. There is no way. And I could smell the thing. Seriously, the strongest and most unusual smell reached me from across the lot. It was about seven feet tall and exactly the way everybody describes it. Long arms and legs, a face that's somewhat human, somewhat like a Wookiee. It had long, shaggy, dark brown hair, some of it hanging from its arms, and a huge hunk of it trailing down its back. The thing had apparently found the wet box of leftover pizza that one of the guys had left behind on a rock when he dodged out of the rain. I know it's not a human in a costume because then I actually see it eat, chewing loudly and completely scarfing it down like something or someone who hasn't eaten in a while. It devoured each slice quickly and it ate like, I don't know, seven pieces or something in under a minute. And then I watched as it wandered and sniffed around the lot, sort of like it was looking for more food. It found a can of Coke, picked it up, sniffed it and dropped it back on the ground. I was frozen in place, half hidden behind the oak, but still getting completely drenched. However, the one good thing about the downpour is that it was keeping me hidden and therefore safe. My car was in the driveway, but the creature didn't seem to notice or care about that. It did want inside the house. It walked up, stood on the new floorboards, and then looked around everywhere. All this time, the rain is just soaking everything, and I'm scared. I can't even blink. And then this rush of wind came and started the rain swirling in a different direction. And that's when the creature looked in my direction and just stopped with its face towards me. I think he had gotten a whiff of my scent. He then picked up a long board from a pile and heaved it in my direction, just missing the tree. 
It was an amazing distance to be able to throw. But then it took off, and it ran fast through all that impossible brush back into the woods. And then it was only a moment or two before I lost complete sight of it. I didn't go back to that lot again for about a month. And now that the house is done, I rent it out, Airbnb. And I tell the tenants not to leave food outside because it could attract bears from those woods. Anyway, that's it. Not my ideal vacation house at all anymore. Thanks again. Hey Lilith, I'm addicted to the kind of stories that are on your channel and I've wanted to write in with my own experience, but I've always been afraid. Not of being ridiculed or anything, people will believe what they believe. You see, I'm a security guard at a major university. I hesitate to say where because I fear the repercussions. At this point, I've already been threatened by the administrators and other organizations that I can only assume are government-related. I work the late shifts with a guy we'll call Brian. We got along great, same sense of humor, and I got him hooked on your podcast. Generally, it's quiet and uneventful at night, although there's the periodic drunken disturbance or theft to deal with. There's a building at the medical school that was condemned, and they were supposed to start work on a fancy new complex within a month, but the building stayed abandoned and off-limits for quite some time. After several months went by with no movement, I began to wonder what was going on. I have to admit, when I went on my nightly patrols, that the building gave me the creeps. It was old, and in the basement they used to store the cadavers that the students dissected. One night, some unmarked container trucks pulled up to the loading dock in the back. It was odd that they would show up at night, but I wasn't privy to the university's plans, so I minded my own business. Men in jumpsuits shuttled large cases and other equipment into the building, and Brian and I joked that it was a secret government experiment like the ones people talk about on your channel. The next night, they showed up again, around 1 a.m., I went on my routine patrol and checked out the place to see what was going on, but I was immediately stopped by two men in black military-style uniforms that told me to stay away from the area. I asked who they were, and they said they were a research company sponsored by the university. This didn't sit right with me, so I asked what they were doing in a condemned building. They were annoyed by my questions and repeated that I should keep away, adding that it was for my own safety. I don't know if it was because of that incident, but the next day, orders came down from our supervisor to leave the building alone until further notice. Over the next week, there was definitely some kind of activity going on. After midnight, trucks would pull up, load and unload stuff, and you could see lights on inside. Brian became obsessed and concocted wild theories like bio-warfare, cloning, open portals, even dissecting alien bodies. I couldn't wrap my head around something nefarious taking place right under our noses at a major university. It made no sense. I shrugged it off, but then things got really weird. I mean, like, scary weird. One night, Brian and I were watching the building from afar when we heard blood-curdling screams coming from within. There was a lot of commotion as people ran in and out and then men with guns appeared and ducked inside. Brian wanted to investigate. I thought he was crazy, so he went by himself. He snuck in through a side entrance while I stayed outside and kept lookout. Another truck pulled up, and more armed men ran inside. I began to worry about Brian. Twenty minutes later, I got a frantic call from him, and I couldn't understand what he was saying, something about I wouldn't believe what he had seen, but then the line cut off. A few minutes after that, he sent some pictures, but they were dark and blurry, and I couldn't really tell what it was. It looked like three naked figures, tall and lanky, with arms longer than normal at the end of a hallway. I tried calling our supervisor, but I couldn't reach him, which was strange. I decided to check out the building myself, but then I saw Brian stumble out, looking like he saw something he seriously wished he hadn't. And then he was immediately accosted by armed men. They traded words, which I couldn't hear, and then he was escorted back into the building. It was clear that he didn't go willingly. 
I raced back to the security office and confronted my supervisor. I told him about Brian and I demanded to know why he didn't answer my calls. He warned me to let whatever happened happen and to not say a word about it. I was in shock. He was obviously hiding something and he looked sick with guilt. I rushed back to the building, but as I approached, I was stopped by two armed men. I asked about Brian, but they didn't know what I was talking about. I stupidly took out my phone and showed them the pictures that Brian sent, and they grabbed my phone. I suddenly got the feeling that they were going to snatch me, too, like they did Brian. Thankfully, my supervisor showed up, dragged me away, and told the men that he had everything under control. I wanted my phone back, but he said forget it, and again, he warned me not to say a word. The next day, I found out that both Brian and my supervisor had resigned. A man in a suit came to me and talked to me and asked a bunch of questions about what I had seen in that building. I said I hadn't seen anything, and he basically threatened me and said to keep it that way. That was the last time any activity took place at that building. Two weeks later, they finally demolished it and began construction on the new complex. I tried to call Brian, but his number was disconnected, and I heard that he had moved out of his apartment to God knows where. It was all very strange. I kept my mouth shut and my nose down for a long time. Until now. I'm thinking of quitting this job and relocating somewhere else. The experience freaked me out, and I have this sick feeling that I'm going to be constantly looking over my shoulder from now on.